Dismayed by the violence of his own species, man is often reluctant to contemplate violence in other animals. Yet a better understanding of animal behavior might lead to a better understanding of our own. Four levels that intercommunicate. Nests at both ends of each level. Food and water in unlimited quantities. A colony of Norway rats. These are the elements for a terrifying experiment. For there will soon be too many rats for this enclosed territory. The lack of space will cause stress. And one result will be less reproduction. The instinct for individual survival will supplant the instinct for survival as a group. The order of precedence in feeding and the assignment of nests is determined by the social relationships that exist between the rats. Among rats, there is no single leader of a group, as there is, for example, among wolves. But there is a class structure, and at the top of this structure are the alphas, the strongest rats. Then there are the betas, dominated by the alphas, but tolerated because of their submissiveness. Finally, at the bottom, the omegas, which are rejected by the rest of the colony and which lead a marginal existence. In this experiment, alphas, betas, and omegas will engage in a life and death struggle for possession of the territory. Aggression, which is restrained between rats of the same class, is now suddenly unleashed on some helpless victim. Conflicts like this further accentuate social differences. These differences are inborn, and the physiological characteristics of the inferior rats prevent them from rising to a higher social class. This rat is obviously an alpha and is in the throes of a fit of murderous fury while others look passively on. When class relationships are normal, the inferior animal signals its submission by offering its throat or side to the dominant rat, and the fight is at an end without further bloodshed. But in this colony, stress is destroying the rat's ability to understand instinctive communication, and aggression is no longer held in check. The violence becomes extreme, and the spilling of blood seems to become a new element of excitement. The result is predictable. Now, in spite of an adequate supply of conventional food, the rats will engage in cannibalism.
Stress caused by limited space soon induces further breakdowns in the patterns of normal behavior. Aggressive frenzy is followed by sexual frenzy. Preliminary courting rights disappear and sexual activity is reduced to its most primitive form, rape. Sexual frenzy leads to confusion of sexual roles. Homosexuality makes its appearance, although a male will accept the advances of another male only if he is a member of the same class or of a lower class. fewer and fewer births. When a birth does occur, it often ends in catastrophe. The maternal instinct is perverted. The female tramples on her young, or abandons them, or devours them. Frequently, the mother dies in childbirth. Those baby rats that are abandoned by their mothers are quickly eliminated by the other members of the colony. This is one method of limiting population growth. It is now the survival of the fittest. But the welfare of the group as a whole is neglected and its average age constantly increases. The survival of the species is no longer guaranteed. Whether they are alphas or omegas, the rats lose all the distinctions of their social rank. Resting places and nests change owners constantly and the rats are crowded in, one on top of another. And now disease completes the ravages already begun by aggression, cannibalism, and sexual frenzy. Under the effects of stress caused by inadequate living space, exaggerated individualism destroys the instinct of group survival. Thus it can be seen how the characteristics of a territory play a vital part in the evolution of a species. In Japan, there are many legends that deal with the association between men and rats. This scroll, about 500 years old, shows us a rat in the role of a young prince. His court is made up of other rats in the costumes of noble ladies, servants, and samurais. In fact, this rat is so princely that he is able to marry a representative of the human species. The wedding between human and rat points up the similarities in taste between the two species. The wedding takes place amid the greatest ostentation as monks play musical instruments and 
and a priest gives his benediction. This well-built animal, with pointed nose and small ears, belongs to the order of rodents. The best known species is Rattus norvegicus, which, despite its name, originated in Asia. From there, it spread all over the world. Its body measures from 8 to 10 inches in length, and it weighs between 10 and 16 ounces. Its tail is thick and is from 6 to 8 inches long. The average lifespan of Rattus norvegicus is from 8 to 11 months. If all their young were to survive, a single pair of these rats could produce 20 million descendants in three years. Their burrows are networks of subterranean passages that are sometimes as far as 18 inches below the surface of the ground. Here the rat keeps his food, breeds, and hides from his enemies. The rat constructs his burrow by using his paws to dig and to carry away the earth. In his mouth, he can carry stones weighing as much as seven ounces. The colony we are now observing consists of 16 rats, seven of which are males. Living space is adequate, sources of food abundant, and the colony can develop freely. Sexual maturity in the female is reached about 75 days after birth and about 95 days after birth in the male. The first sign of sexual maturity is mutual sniffing and then an inspection of the genitals. Copulation is extremely rapid, lasting only about three seconds. If there is ejaculation, the male licks his penis. If the female is not in heat, a resistance will discourage the male, who will then seek out another female. The female is in heat from six to 10 hours. During that period, she may be mounted about a hundred times. The male, after a few thrusts, emits ultrasonic cries that signal a temporary respite from sexual activity. When the female is pregnant, she looks for a nest or builds one in her burrow. She will use any material available, straw, bits of cloth, leaves, paper. A rat's nest has no special shape. It simply takes the form of the female lying in it. The period of gestation lasts about 21 days. It may last 10 days more in a female who is still nursing her previous litter. A female can produce from three to six litters a year, and a litter usually consists of about 10 pups. Even before she is finished dropping her young, the female starts to fulfill her motherly duties. With its head between her paws, she licks each offspring as it emerges from her body. She removes the membranes, cuts the umbilical cord, and eats the placenta. She licks the genital area of the baby rat, which stimulates its intestine and bladder, thus permitting urine and excrement to be evacuated normally. Deprived of this treatment, the young rat would eat freely, but unable to excrete, it would die.
Only the mother looks after the litter. The males are totally uninterested in their young. It takes about two weeks before the baby rats begin to open their eyes. The quality of the care provided by the mother for her offspring depends on her social status. The higher this is, the better the care will be. And to provide it, the mother must be left in peace for the first few days after giving birth. The development of the baby rats is fairly slow and the litter requires maternal care for a period of from 30 to 40 days. But by the 30th day, the babies acquire greater independence. They explore the surroundings of their burrow and they mix with the adult rats. It is at this point that they are confirmed in their status as alphas, betas or omegas. In a colony, the dominant alpha rats can be recognized mainly by their skill in being the first to find food. They are also the ones whose burrows are usually closest to the sources of supply. is omnivorous. He can feed on grain or flesh, depending on what is available, and he is not averse to eating eggs. The rat has often been pictured pulling another rat along by the tail, while the other rat holds an egg in its paws. But it probably doesn't happen this way because the effort is not really necessary. The shell need only be slightly damaged for the rat to break it, eat up the egg, or carry it off. An unbroken egg is too difficult for him to manage. The territory of this colony is both horizontal and vertical. There are paths both below and above the ground. A search for food is the rat's main concern, and his ingenuity is astonishing. The social inferiority of some rats is quite obvious. Even if this rat has almost reached his goal, he will have to turn back and make way for the other. The rat is always watchful. A strange noise close at hand and all the rats disappear. Rats have poor eyesight, but this is compensated for by highly developed senses of touch, smell and hearing. If access routes to food are changed, the rats will not take long to find alternatives. They quickly recognize elements which they have already used.
Rattus norvegicus can form a sort of hook with his tail, which is semi-prehensile. The food is still in the same place, but the rope has been removed. The rats then try to reach their provision by repeating their customary maneuvers. One of the strongest of the alphas will quickly reach his target by jumping a distance of 18 inches. Since the food is in solid form, the rat carries it off. But he will soon be chased by the others who have not yet found out how to obtain it for themselves. A few other rats will also discover how to get there. But their physical skills are not always adequate. When he finds solid food, the rat tends to carry it off, either to eat it under cover or to store it in a safe place. When pursued, he uses a complex network of paths that are well known to all members of the colony. But he may be robbed along the way, or he may even forget where he has hidden the food. Climbing on smooth pipe is no easy task. Some rats sense that it is wiser to eat higher up, where there's less risk of having their food stolen. Because he was unable to jump, this rat uses the wire that holds the platform. His initial awkwardness is soon replaced by surprising skill. The normal activities of a colony often give rise to mild forms of aggression. Two rats touch noses. This action alone may cause the inferior animal to flee. But the arched back, the sides pushed forward, the little jumps, all this means trouble. If there is a fight, the bites will come quickly and the inferior animal will soon run away.
Water is no obstacle when food is the goal, even if it's the first time the rat has ever had to dive in. Once his fears are overcome, he's a good swimmer. Both on the surface and underwater, he shows perfect control of his respiratory rhythm. Whatever the obstacle to be overcome, the rat always tries to carry the food back to his burrow. Like the elbow of a drain pipe, this system illustrates one of the access routes used by the rat. This is how he sometimes manages to get into a house. The territory is inviolable. Its frontiers are not only geographical, but are also determined by postings of urine and excrement. If a rat from another colony ventures into a foreign territory, it will be mercilessly chased. The intruder is flushed out by one of the males of the colony, but he is unable to escape. He will be chased and killed. Two pairs of foreign alphas have been introduced into the colony. There is no reason, theoretically, why they should not mix normally with the other rats. However, they are confused because they don't know the territory. 
Their first impulse is to seek shelter in unoccupied burrows or in the water or above ground. But their behavior and their smell will betray their presence. Because the colony is highly unified, these alpha intruders will be treated like lowly omegas. The colony as a group instinctively defends its territory, although its members do not feel individually threatened by the intruders. The fight between individuals of the same colony is usually limited to an exchange of rapid bites to the lower back or the tail. But when the struggle is with intruders, the attacks are deliberately aimed at vital points like the throat, the side, or the carotid artery. The organization of a territory mainly depends on the availability of food supplies. If there is not enough food, the rat will quickly become carnivorous, preying on animals smaller or weaker than himself. Sometimes a whole group of rats will attack another animal. It is the constant search for new sources of food that modifies a territory and determines its development. The rat's territory occupies an area which is not his alone. The area's ecological balance is assured by the many other species that live there. Thus, in this territory, the rat may meet his natural predators, such as the falcon, which can dive on him at 120 miles per hour. The owl, too, 
is a dangerous predator of rodents. Like many other species, the rat adapts his activities to those of his predators. If they are nocturnal, like the owl, then the rat will be active during the day, and vice versa. The snake, the fox, and other carnivores are also enemies of the rat. As for man, he is both predator and provider. Man's habits of consumption, storage, and transport have encouraged rats to follow him to the ends of the earth. Man and rat are inseparable, and the world's rat population is believed to be about equal to that of man. A rat's incisors grow about five inches a year, and he wears them down by gnawing on all kinds of substances, causing power failures and fires. He attacks electrical wires, gnaws metal, and even burrows his way through concrete. of many diseases, the rat is infected with parasites and represents a constant danger to world health. Old people, infants, and the bedridden are particularly vulnerable to its bites. In Bombay, hospitals treat 20,000 cases of rat bite fever every year. In the United States, 14,000 cases occur annually. Through its excrement and urine, which contain larvae and bacteria, the rat contaminates domestic animals and infects food in storehouses. This is how millions of people become afflicted by trichina, amoebiasis, leptospirosis, and the 600 forms of salmonellosis. Rats have been associated with the plague for centuries, but it was only a hundred years ago that scientists discovered how this disease was transmitted from rat to man. Several species of fleas, parasites of the rat feed on its blood and develop in the microclimate of its burrow. If a rat suffers from septicemic plague, its fleas will ingest Yersin's bacillus, which is the pestiferous organism. The animal on which the fleas live will soon die, and they will have to find another host. Flea's new host will not necessarily be another rat. Man also offers a suitable environment for fleas, and they pass on the bacillus when they bite their human host. Two types of plague have decimated the human race since the earliest times, pneumonic and bubonic. 
After an incubation period of one to ten days, the latter produces a very serious toxic infectious syndrome with the rapid appearance of the characteristic bubo. If left untreated, the disease results in death in five to eight days. In the sixth century AD, bubonic plague struck the whole Mediterranean area, causing the death of about a hundred million people. The famous Black Death of the Middle Ages was a pneumonic disease. In seven years, it carried off between a quarter and half the population. Just as serious as the plague, murine typhus is also carried by rat fleas. These two diseases, plague and typhus, have often decided the outcome of wars by depleting the ranks of armies. In more recent times, pneumonic plague was responsible for 12 million deaths in India during the first half of this century. Areas where rodents are infected by plague still constitute a permanent danger. The speed of air transport and modern techniques of container transport place any city in the world only a few hours away from these centers of infection. Rats have always carried infection. Ratus ratus, the carrier of the Black Death in the Middle Ages. Ratus Raja in India. Ratus exulens in the Pacific. Ratus sabanus in Thailand, the oldest species of all. An engraving by Rembrandt, The Hunting of Rats. Inhabiting man's granaries since earliest antiquity, this unwelcome guest has brought only sickness, famine, and death. Yet man possesses numerous ways of destroying rats. Red squill, the poison already known to the ancient Egyptians, causes paralysis of the respiratory system. It does not always result in death, however, and the poison is dangerous to other animals. Other poisons used against rats include arsenic, strychnine, zinc phosphide, anchu, or alpha naphthyl thiouria, which is not permitted in certain countries, as well as 1080 and thallium sulfate. But all these are also very dangerous to man and to animals. In the fight to exterminate rats, anticoagulants, such as warfarin and pival, which are supposed to cause death by internal hemorrhage, are no longer considered particularly effective for the rat can apparently become immune to these poisons and can transmit this immunity to his descendants. This animal, for example, has been absorbing anticoagulants for a week and is still in good health. He belongs to a new race called the super rat. Rats cause great damage to agriculture in all countries and are said to be responsible for the annual loss of some 33 million tons of cereals. In the United States alone, their destructiveness costs about a billion dollars a year. Barns and stables are particularly infested.
Although its results may seem spectacular, hydrogen cyanide gas is hardly more effective than other poisons. After the first convulsions, the rat can manage to escape, even though partially paralyzed. But gases can have a deadly effect on humans, and this too limits their usefulness. Cats. The domestic cat is often thought of as a great hunter of rats, but in reality he much prefers chasing mice. The ferret, on the other hand, will dig the rat out of his burrow. Rats are not his only diet, however, and promoting the uncontrolled breeding of the ferret might well endanger ecological balance. Because rats are strongly attracted to the smell of beer, the traditional way of catching them is to make a trap out of a barrel. The rat tries to hang on to the corks, which always sink. The endurance of rats in water has been demonstrated by experiments where they've been able to swim for up to 80 hours. But in beer, they suffocate and drown in a short time. The corks floating on the surface conveniently conceal the victim from his fellow rats. A good way of catching a rat alive is to place a cage up against a wall. The rat usually keeps close into a vertical surface and will inadvertently enter the cage. Once in the trap, it will gnaw at the bars so furiously that it will often injure itself. The effectiveness of a trap depends largely on where it is placed, for the rat is highly suspicious of any object found along its usual path. Contrary to popular belief, neither the example nor the smell of the rat in the trap will stop the other rats from being caught in the same way. The king of rats, a kind of wheel formed by rats with their tails knotted together, was long believed to be fictitious. But two examples do exist, the latest having been found in Hamburg in 1964. It is still a mystery, however, for no one knows how the knot was made. The reaction of disgust that the rat provokes in man is not universal. In the temple of Deshnook in India, some 10,000 rats feast on devotional offerings. The rat is respected for its intelligence, cunning and wisdom. The sacred rat accompanies the elephant-headed goddess Ganesha. The cycle of the Chinese and Japanese zodiac begins with the year of the rat, the sign of prosperity. The 
The Japanese god Daikoku, scattering golden coins with his magic hammer, is worshipped along with the rats that accompany him. To be truly rich is to have the means of keeping several rats. But in our Western culture, rats are not venerated. And St. Gertrude of Nivelle was attributed with the gift of chasing them from house and field. And at Carpentras in France, on the portal of the Church of St. Cifrin, the spirit of evil is symbolized by rats encircling the earth. The legend of the Pied Piper of Hamelin is still the best known story about rats. In the Middle Ages, Hamelin was infested with rats. A piper offered his services to the burghers, who promised him a large sum of money if he could rid the town of this vermin. Playing his magic pipe, he charmed the rats into the river where they all drowned. The rat is undoubtedly harmful, and man has been trying to exterminate this universal pest for centuries. But serious scientific studies of the behavior of the rat have been undertaken only in recent years. These studies show more and more that the rat's impressive ability to adapt is further encouraged by man's negligence. There are about 570 species of rats. Certain of these species can produce individuals whose varying chromosome makeup does not prevent them from reproducing as it does in other animals. And this capacity seems to give the rat an almost unlimited ability to adapt. If only one pair of rats remained on Earth, should they be exterminated? This is a question the scientist hesitates to answer, for we don't yet fully understand the part played by this formidable creature in the overall pattern of the world's ecology. Ihr lieben Leut, die ihr von fern her kamt heran, hier fängt sogleich ein Spiel vom Rattenfänger an. In dem könnt ihr von ungefähr so sehen, was im Jahre 1284 hier in Hameln ist geschehen. Hamelin was saved, but the miserly burghers refused to pay the piper. And so while the burghers were in church thanking God for their economical deliverance from the rats, the piper took his revenge. Using his magic pipe once more, he this time charmed the children of the town to follow him. Doch nun passt auf, das Spiel beginnt. Gleich werdet ihr erfahren, was nach der Sage hier geschehen vor vielen hundert Jahren. The children of Hamelin were never seen again, and neither was the Pied Piper. <lacht>